All right, thank you all for staying to the end, which we have attempted to make sweet and satisfying. Um, Randy is going to talk to us about its numbers all the way down. So, uh, I want to begin with a few prefatory remarks. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be arguing uh, that Jerry was deeply wrong about some of his central claims, uh, but I want everyone to understand that I, I think it's very much more important to the progress of science to be deeply wrong than not wrong at all, and uh, <laughs> not even wrong, as they say and that uh, one of his great contributions was explaining why all the people out there who are not even wrong were not even wrong. Or what, uh, and this was hugely influential on my own thinking. I came to Rutgers in part because Jerry was here and because I admired so much uh, his contribution uh, to cognitive science and it had been so influential on my own thinking and also just because I liked him. Uh, it was, uh, Jerry was infinitely one of the funniest people I ever uh, knew and uh, just being in idle conversation or even argument with Jerry uh, was uh, invariably amusing, sometimes infuriating, but uh, invariably uh, amusing. He had an incredibly invent uh, inventive and relentless wit. Uh, I also, uh, uh, want to thank uh, Brian and Ernie in particular for extremely valuable uh, feedback here. Uh, I have never before given a talk about concepts. Uh, Jerry and I were sailors and we, uh, when you're sailing you uh, often have a lot of time to talk and uh, Jerry and I both being very argumentative we argued and we often argued about concepts, but I was, <laughs> it was like me going up against uh, Muhammad Ali when it came to uh, arguing <laughs> about concepts. Uh, <laughs> I was totally outgunned. Uh, I had never read uh, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, right? So when Jerry assured me, as he repeatedly did, that Quine had uh, destroyed the analytic synthetic distinction, uh, all I could do was, mm, okay. <laughs> One of these days I'll have to read that and see why. Uh, but this was uh, uh, came up repeatedly in, in uh, Jerry's and my arguments. Anyway, I, I was extremely nervous about addressing this audience in particular, <laughs> who contains several of the world's primary thinkers about uh, both young and old about the nature of concepts that seemed a little foolish for uh, an amateur like me to venture into this ring. Uh, but and also cowardly, right? I mean, I should have done all this when Jerry was still around to explain what it was so crazy, right? So it's really very cowardly of me to do this uh, when uh, he's no longer here to point out the error of my ways. All right, so that's uh, all my way of uh, preamble. Another part is that I think, I hope it will be obvious that um, um, almost everything I'm saying picks up very much on uh, ideas and themes that I detected in this morning's talk uh, talks, particularly by uh, both Lisa and Eric, and also that this is uh, the antithesis of Kevin. This is, uh, uh, not only are there billions of uh, uh, primitive concepts, as Kevin would argue, I'm going to argue that there are practically none, uh, that they're almost all entirely generative, uh, and that we know what the primitive is from which the primitive is from which they're generated. Uh, so the thesis that I'll be arguing is that uh, concepts are uh, generative, as I just said, and that numbers, I have to turn, I hate turning to read, but it turns out, I can't, let me see if I can't make this bigger. I can't read my own screen here. Well, I'll lean forward and then over and I'll look up. Uh, numbers, which I interpret in the sort of computer science sense, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, they don't have a mystical significance for me. Numbers are the physical realization of the symbols in computing machines that represent quantities. Okay, uh, so in current con uh, computing machines, basically numbers are bit patterns, usually realized as uh, uh, voltage patterns. Uh, that's my understanding of uh, new, uh, what numbers are. 
And I, I'm going to argue that they are the primitives. That's why it's numbers all the way down. Uh, and that the, a physically realized ordered field of the rational numbers is the generating system. I mean, this is what two things are built, or several things, built into a computing machine. First of all, bit patterns, uh, the symbols for numbers, and second of all, uh, a system for manipulating uh, numbers in an extremely uh, traditional form, uh, namely the uh, rules of arithmetic as formulated by, say, Knopf in his analytic theory of functions. Um, now, if, uh, a point that I want to make in the rather unlikely uh, event that there's a neuroscientist in the audience, uh, I want to describe what I think is the single most important thing that a neuroscientist uh, could know uh, from cognitive science, uh, and that uh, that is the tokens of number types, that is the physically realized instances of symbols for a particular number, the bit pattern that represents three, for example, do not pre-exist. There isn't a drawer in the computing machine that has all the 11s and another drawer that has all the 15s and another drawer for the 1,741,000s. Uh, all the numbers are generated in it. This is so obvious and so trivial, but I think people miss the point of this. The numbers in any functioning computing machine, and I take the brain to be a functioning computing machine, are generated on the fly in the process of computation itself. Why do I think that's so important? Well, because neurons aren't generated on the fly, all right? So if you think uh, seven is symbolized by a seven neuron, then your problem is how we generate more uh, seven neurons every time the need for a seven comes up in the uh, tw 20 milliseconds in which that need is, uh, is present. Um, so, if we're looking for the physical realization of these number system, uh, numbers, we have to look at the level of biological structure at which uh, entities capable of representing numbers are routinely generated uh, on very short notice uh, and, re and in response to computational needs, and that means that we have to look at the molecular level. The only level of structure at which we know this to be true is the molecular structure. Polynucleotides, for example, are being generated inside every uh, cell as I speak. Uh, so that it means that we're, if we want to find the basis for the computational uh, theory of mind, looking at the neuronal level is the wrong level to look at. You have to look at the molecular level inside uh, neurons. Uh, so, the, another part of the thesis is that the language of thought constantly generates new concepts in its attempt to represent experience in useful ways. This was uh, very much uh, in line with what at least I understood Eric to be uh, arguing, and I know Brian Scholl in the back and I agree about uh, this, and that more complex concepts, for example, the concept of a rotation, uh, are internally represented as orderly uh, arrangements of these primitive symbols. So, for example, the concept of rotation is internally represented, at least in a computing machine, and I believe in our brains, by the rotation uh, matrix. Uh, and the, ma the rotation matrix is, as many of you, but perhaps not all of you know, is just an orderly arrangement of four numbers. Uh, it's a square. Uh, matrix and a matrix is built up from the primitives and the primitives from which it's built up from our numbers. So that's the thesis and what I take something extremely odd is going on. The slide that is showing big is not the slide that's up there. Huh? I'm in the presenter view, but it's not behaving properly. That, but anyway, uh, it, yeah, it's for some reason. I've, it's I've, interchanged the next slide, which is small, and right. the slide that's actually so up there. So this is the next slide. Yeah, uh, but there's 
and it makes for considerable difficulty. I can't uh, see. Ah, you seem to have taken care of it, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, oh what can we do without Chris? Uh, thank you, Chris. Okay. So uh, I would like to argue that this salvages. So I've now read uh, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Right, and uh, well, yeah, it was worth it. <laughs> I only read it about three weeks ago <laughs> um, when I was preparing this talk, and I discovered to my astonishment that one part of it is an attack on the very notion of synonym, uh, synonymy. Uh, and Quine says, well, uh, you know, who knows how we determine synonyms? And gee, if you start with the numbers, synonymy seems like a no-brainer, right? And uh, some of you heard me earlier, I, I mean, uh, let me give you numerical instances of synonymy. There's uh, one number I'm thinking of, uh, and this is the intentional version, is the uh, multiplicative identity. Uh, another number I'm thinking of uh, is the number that you get when you subtract two from three. Now, who knew? They're the same number, right? Uh, this seems like Frege's problem, right? But it doesn't seem like much of a problem when you uh, pose it that way. Why are they the same number? Because the, when you evaluate these two expressions, the bit patterns they yield are identical. And the machine has built into it uh, one of its most pr basic primitive operations for dealing with these symbols is the check for identity. It's equivalent to the check for numerical equality. Um, the, I like to think that this way of approaching the thing also clarifies in the notion of inferential role. I'm gonna, uh, we'll, I'll develop that further. Um, it makes uh, many concepts definitional, but in, in sort of Eric's sense, they are defined by the processes that generate them. Thus, if we take, for example, the platypus example that we were discussing, you see your first platypus, you draw upon your shape representation uh, system in order to uh, have a, find the set of uh, shape parameters that in, efficiently encode uh, that shape. And that now is, until you learn more things about platypuses, that basically is your uh, concept of a platypus. Platypus is something that uh, looks like that. And of course, it enables you to recognize the next platypus that you see. Because if you encode that and the parameter values match within some uh, limit, then you've just seen your second uh, platypus on uh, this story. So the uh, process has been death. I realize I can see George frowning in my face that I'm departing considerably here from the normal notion of definition uh, in philosophical circles. But I'm arguing, well, let's consider, suppose we meant this. By definition, I think it's not totally unconnected to the traditional uh, notion. And one of its immediate consequences is that there are infinitely many functionally equivalent definitions for most concepts. And I already illustrated that point with the concept of the number one, right? There are, uh, you can, I hope it was obvious from that example, but there are infinitely many ways of defining uh, the number one within the system of, of arithmetic. Another nice thing about this approach, and I always thought, boy, the uh, uh, Toter nailed it and showed what was wrong with almost all other, certainly psychological approaches to concepts when he pointed out that it was non-negotiable that concepts had to be composable. Uh, and I thought, boy, he got that right. Uh, <laughs> and he was absolutely right. That's the reason why most of these theories weren't even wrong, right? I mean, they, the first requirement was composability, and they weren't composable, so they weren't even wrong. I mean, they hadn't even gotten off the ground. Uh, now, as Fodor uh, conceded to me while we were sailing, and as uh, is they, he and uh, Zenon concede in their book, uh, definitions compose. But of course, Jerry took that back from me almost immediately by <laughs> the other part of Quine's argument, but there are no definitions. so. The fact that definitions uh, compose doesn't uh, buy you anything on this sort of thing. Now, of course, where, to my mind, Jerry was deeply wrong was when he reached this conclusion, right? 
uh, that the uh, doorknob and carburetor are primitive concepts. So, uh, like virtually, or like a great many people, I think even Milo, who is more sympathetic to Jerry's arguments than I am, but it seemed to me the compositionality of doorknob was right there on the surface, and it was uh, incredibly perverse to deny the compositionality of uh, doorknob. And so, and I think this is in the spirit of many of Jerry's arguments, I took this as a kind of reductio ad absurdum. It showed why mad dog nativism must be wrong, but of course it raised the challenge. There were an awful lot of good arguments on the way to this reductio ad absurdum, so the challenge for anyone who thought this was clearly uh, absurd uh, was to deal with these, uh, uh, with these intermediate steps, and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, now another conspicuous thing about uh, Jerry's approach to concepts, and as near as I can tell, essentially all philosophical approaches to concepts, um, and psychological ones for that, and so on. People start the inquiry into concepts by worrying about dogs and cats and, uh, and uh, carburetors and doorknobs and uh, so on. Um, and because, partly because of the experimental work I do and the animals that I work with, which aren't human, uh, this seems to me like absolutely the wrong way, the wrong things to start with if you're thinking about what concepts are. Uh, you should start with concepts like distance and direction and numerosity and time and probability and likelihood and shape. All of which have the property that they're not deictically instantiable. I'm too bad Zen and isn't here, but, but you can't have a pointer to duration. I, the, the concept of duration. It's not clear to me that you can even have a pointer to an individual instance of duration, but I certainly did, don't see how you could have a pointer uh, to the concept, to, to whatever, to what's out there in the world that instantiates duration qua concept as, a, as opposed to a particular token of uh, duration. Um, so the basic concepts cannot be pointed to, and they cannot be tracked. They're, they're extremely abstract. Um, one of the things we've learned, is kind of a side, but it's relevant to the argument, is that the level at which genes work is also vastly more abstract than we realized, certainly when I was uh, young. And, and when I was young, it was one gene, one protein. That's still true. But we didn't realize that some of those proteins were symbols for distal. Distal is a pretty abstract uh, concept, and so is anterior, right? Particularly because the, 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 those, I'm talking about the homeobox genes, but those are the ones that are uh, very widely conserved and used throughout almost the entire animal kingdom to uh, lay out the basic structure of an, uh, of an organism. And these genes operate at an extremely abstract uh, level. So if I, if I think genes, operate at that level of abstraction. I don't see why uh, the internal representations of concepts shouldn't also be tackled at that uh, level in, uh, of abstraction. Now, this is a bit of a side thing, but I sort of assumed that Zenon would be here, and I'm deeply disappointed that he's, he's not. I think he's in very ill health, which is another great sadness. Uh, but, uh, of course, Dogs and the things that philosophers usually talk about are objects, and uh, so one wants to have some story about what uh, objects are, and on this story, and Alan will resonate to this, this goes back to our seminar days, that uh, on this story, well, objects are purely intentional, right? I mean, the, whether there's objects out there in the world is uh, at least as debatable as whether there's red uh, out there in the world. Uh, but qua uh, concepts, uh, I'm a big fan of the idea that they are uh, worms in space-time. That is, they're shapes in a four-dimensional uh, space-time manifold. And I know that Alan thinks that's not a crazy view, and Anne Traceman uh, also thought I rather liked that. I never clear whether Susan Perry liked it or not. Um, Analyticity. So on this story, and again, I know I'm departing from uh, analytic as it, I've benefited from both Brian and Ernie 
in many of these things. And this story of meaning is analytic uh, insofar as it depends only on the characteristics of the system that processes the relevant symbols, not on what those symbols may or may not refer to. Thus, analytic truths may prove to be uh, not true and may prove to be false, not truth preserving, uh, once reference has been assigned, and I will lay out the, the color as an example of that here in a bit. Um, but on this story, they're nonetheless analytic. If we believe that something is true, simply because when we crank the machinery, uh, it spits out true independent of the uh, reference. So for example, that the, the multiplicative identity is uh, the same as the result of subtracting two from three, I think that's true. Uh, I don't, in believing that, I make no appeal whatsoever to what those numbers might uh, refer to. It seems to be a property of the system itself, the, the inferential system, and have nothing to do with the reference that are assigned to them. Um, so on this, but of course reference, we wouldn't have these symbols in a computing machine if we didn't assign them reference, right? This isn't like tic-tac-toe uh, or chess. This, this isn't a meaningless game. The, uh, I added the paraphrase of Wigner's famous paper on the unreasonable efficacy of uh, arithmetic in the natural sciences uh, because uh, at the core of this argument is that uh, this very simple arithmetic, the axioms for arithmetic occupy a single small page in a paper in, in Knopf's analytic theory of functions. It's, its power to represent things is, is, is astonishing. Um, and uh, that's really the start of my, my whole uh, argument. Um, the, uh, so these uh, symbols have analytic or intentional, purely intentional properties, but uh, of course, once we assign reference, they also have extensional meanings. And these meanings can be in conflict. Thus, there may be uh, facts that are true analytically, and I'll give color uh, uh, color opponents as an example here in a moment, because of the way the symbols are processed, but false extensionally. That is, the, the, the mind that you <coughs> it won't necessarily endorse the truth uh, that you get when you uh, uh, run the symbol processing, even though you can demonstrate that it's true of the percepts of the very individual who denies uh, their truth. Uh, however, that said, it's an extremely important point that generally in any representational system, the intentional part and the, that is the symbol manipulation part and the referential uh, part are interdependent. Depending on how you've assigned the reference, you can use some, none, or a little tiny bit of the representational system. This comes straight out of the theory of measurement, which was also very influential in my uh, uh, early uh, development. The, mo the most trivial example of this is that among the things we use numbers for are uh, on the jerseys of athletic players. Right? And it's very useful. But if you ask how much arithmetic can you do with those numbers, <laughs> it's not done. <laughs> One of the arithmetic operators is the identity operator. And that's the whole reason for assigning numbers on uh, jerseys. But of course, addition, multiplication, ordering, right? I mean, the the guy with, or the woman with uh, jersey number 12 isn't necessarily faster or a better goal scorer or whatever than the woman with jersey number 10. Uh, so the only property of the number system that you can use is the name property. Numbers make superb names, so another point that I'll return to. Uh, but that is nonetheless a, a use of the number uh, system. And it illustrates this interdependence. Once you understand the reference, the rules for reference assignment for athletic journey, journal jerseys, you, I hope, understand that adding those numbers isn't going to get you anywhere, right? It's, uh, so that all of that part of the machinery, uh, the intentional system, is out of bounds. Um, so I want to illustrate this with the uh, contrasting the vector representation of locations and colors. And part of the reason that I'm doing this is that uh, 
And Brian Joel and I were rhapsodizing about this uh, paper by Doris Tsao. Any of you who are interested in the material realization of mental things have got to read Doris uh, Tsao's paper on, uh, what's the title, Brian? How? The Primate Code for Space Recognition. Yeah, The Primate Code for Space uh, Recognition. It's a fabulous paper. For space uh, recognition. For face, 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 uh, for face recognition, for face uncoding. Uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, faces are points in, uh, well, we were somewhat discussing the dimensionality of the space, but in a vector space with a dimensionality somewhere between 25 and 50. Right? And that you can identify at the neurobiological level the basis vectors for that space. It's a, it's a really awesome uh, paper. And I bring it up because on the face of it, uh, faces <laughs> so something that you think it represent as a vector, right? Uh, because uh, one of my points is that these numbers uh, are incredibly uh, powerful. Uh, so, uh, the, if I tell you, so vectors of course are used to represent positions in space, right? And, and movements in space and so on. Now if I tell you, that I, ran, in my job today, I ran all day long north-south. I ran five miles an hour north-south. And because I ran uh, for five, two hours, uh, five miles an hour north-south, I ended up ten miles north-south of where I started. Does that something bother you about that? <laughs> 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 Do you think it has anything to do with your empirical knowledge of uh, things, or does it feel like somehow this is analytic? I mean, does it feel like uh, you can't go both north and south at the same time? Some, some, one location cannot be both north of and south of another location. Just, to me, at least, this feels deeply uh, analytic. We wouldn't need to go out and do an experiment to determine whether this was uh, true. Uh, now, of course, if you look at the underlying vector representation, you say, well, yeah, our representation of points in the plane uses bipolar vectors. They have sign, right? Uh, and it's a basic property of the numbers that a number cannot be both positive and negative, right? It's either positive or negative. So that's a basic property of the system that we seem to be relying on. Now, another fact which some philosophers, particularly Brian, uh, and which uh, I think uh, Brian Joel as well, and many of us have taught in introductory psychology, it takes some courage to do that. But the, uh, uh, another empirical fact about psychology is that there are an infinity uh, of color pairs that are mutually exclusive. That you cannot be both red and green at the same time. You cannot appear, thank you Brian, you cannot appear both red and green at the same time. This, you can sort of check this. When I tell undergraduate students this, many of them don't believe it. <laughs> and right lately I've said, well, start looking on Google for reddish-green colors. Uh, and it isn't because you won't find combination. If you look for blue-green, every decorator in town will show up on your web page. But if you look for reddish-green, uh, you won't. Uh, somehow that doesn't seem to be a kind of color that one can have. Now we've understood for more than a century uh, why this is true. Because we've understood for more than a century that uh, the brain represents colors in a three-dimensional bipolar vector space. In other words, it's using exactly the same formal representation that we use to uh, represent uh, locations out there in the world. And this space has privileged axes. Right? Red-green is one of those axes, plays exactly the same role as north-south uh, in the uh, other, and uh, yellow-blue is another uh, axis of the space, and together they define the four uh, primitive colors, right? But you can go northeast and you can have blue-green, but you can't, but there are an infinity of pairs of directions that you cannot be simultaneously going, right? You cannot be simultaneously going northeast and southwest any more than you can be simultaneously going uh, north and, and, and south. And exactly the same thing is true for colors. 
But this is not truth preserving in the, intu in the normal intuitive uh, sense that philosophers describe. I once had a philosopher who uh, talked at some length at lunch with a philosopher, uh, Brian tells me he must have read Wittgenstein, uh, who firmly believed that the exclusivity of red and green was analytic. That is, he believed, but in the traditional philosophical sense, he believed that if you knew what the word green meant, then you knew it couldn't be red. You couldn't have any red uh, in it. I told him that the same was true of yellow and blue. He was astonished to hear this and deeply skeptical. <laughs> I had to persuade him, look, it's been a truth of color science, uh, an agreed upon truth for many, many decades that yellow and blue are just as exclusive, uh, mutually exclusive as red and green. So after a lot of uh, sort of posing as a great authority on this, I persuaded him grudgingly to accept that this might be true. Uh, and so obviously he didn't believe that yellow, that, uh, that uh, the, the mutual exclusivity of yellow and blue was analytic in his sense because it would have meant he grew to the age of 50 without knowing what blue meant, despite being a native speaker of English. Uh, but he still believed that red-green exclusion <laughs> was uh, analytic. So where does my argument come out with regard to this philosopher? Well, one part of it says, look, if we just consult what we know scientifically about the underlying way in which the brain represents uh, reflectance uh, spectra, then uh, we understand why these are mutually exclusive. But unlike with locations and directions, that aspect of the computational architecture plays no role in our everyday reasoning about uh, color. And that's why we are astonished to discover that there are an infinite number of uh, uh, mutually ex exclusive color uh, uh, pairs. Um, Okay, I'll cover that. Uh, I've covered all of that. Uh, now, why, Rochelle raised the question, uh, why are the integers special? Uh, anyone familiar with the history of, uh, of, of mathematics knows that the integers are, are special, right? And uh, Brewer famously summarized this view by saying, God made the integers, all else is the work of man. And, and uh, the question is, why on this, do we get an account of why uh, the integers are special, uh, and why it has always seemed that somehow they were the foundation of the number system, and that all the other, the rational numbers, had to be built up or derived from them in some way. This historic history is antithetical to where I come from because I work on, for example, the representation of probability in mice. Now, probability, the, the numbers that represent probability are generated by dividing one integer by another integer. Right? If the rational numbers were somehow walled off from the integers, uh, there would be a very serious uh, problem here that is, uh, if one of them were represented by voltages and another was represented by bit patterns, uh, then it's hard to see how you could ever get the uh, representation of a probability from the representation of two discrete numerosities. And of course it goes the other way as well. Any, uh, any uh, non-integer number divided by itself yields an integer, right? So there's this in the grinding of the machinery, it's constantly moving back and forth from between uh, symbols for discrete quantities and symbols for continuous quantities. So why, uh, when we get to the history of mathematics, do the discrete, uh, the number as symbols for discrete quantities seem to play a special role? Um, I'm, this story, there's a fairly obvious reason why that's true. All the numbers that don't represent integer, all the numbers that are used only to represent uh, continuous quantities, uh, this isn't true for probabilities, but for most of them, uh, the, uh, for all the numbers that represent weights and distances and durations and uh, so on, they are not unique. They're uh, unique only up to the specification of a scalar. This, this is, of course, units, right? When I say the distance is three. <laughs> I haven't specified the distance, right? 
I have to say, three kilometers or three parsecs or three nanometers, right? Uh, or otherwise, I really haven't said anything. And there was a one of the missile shoots uh, failed because the subcontractors were using a different unit for uh, some critical quantity. <laughs> <from> the, uh, <laughs> so uh, specifying the units uh, is essential as part of the referential system. So there would seem to be an arbitrariness between a kind of ambiguity or undefinedness of the relationship between any continuous quantity and the, numeric, and the symbol that represents it. But when it comes to numerosity, this isn't true. You, the multiplicative identity, one, which is defined purely internally, right? I take to be a self-evidently analytic, uh, analytically defined element of the arithmetic uh, system, must represent the numerosity of a set that contains only one um, element. Otherwise, when you start doing the bookkeeping, you're rapidly going to run into deep trouble. And it's an interesting exercise to sit down and say, well, suppose we use two to represent the numerosity of a set of one. I leave it as an exercise for the uh, audience uh, to uh, spell out what would soon happen if we began adding and multiplying with this representation of the numerosity of sets. So the basic point is that here, the reference, there, there's a much tighter than usual coupling of the referential side of things to the uh, to the purely analytic side of things in that the analyticity dictates the reference and you could argue vice versa that the reference uh, dictates some of the properties of or most of the properties of the analytic machine. A sort of final arriving I hope I didn't have it. Um, so I alluded earlier to the fact that numbers can be used for innumerable, you know, not just representing what we ordinarily think of as, qu as quantities. And uh, numbers make really great names. Uh, and anyone who's serious in a computing machine knows that the name, name, need to make another name arises every few minutes. Uh, in my, every time I define a new variable, I have to come up with a name for that variable. And the amount of time and anguish and subsequent revision I exercise in uh, pondering what would be the most felicitous name for some uh, quantity that I've just uh, computed uh, is very troublesome indeed. It seems quite trivial, but as I think uh, <laughs> uh, David um, would testify, it's a, it's a recurring problem to come up with uh, names. And this is a more general part of this. What I'm arguing is not only are these the symbols for the quantities that are most primitive, both evolutionarily, that is, even the simplest organisms, even bacteria that are doing plume following, need to represent the quantities that they're encountering. So I think of these things as evolutionarily primitive, but I also think of them as purely formally primitive. That is, I think of them as the elements out of which everything else, all the other symbols, are uh, constructed. And many of those symbols are simply names. But even the naming, the use of the numbers as names for things, draws on the properties of uh, these symbols qua numbers. And here, David, if I get this wrong, uh, you, you correct me, okay? Because I, I'm going to start talking to you about hash codes. I've known that hash codes were something that existed. There was a name for something in computer science for decades. But I had no clue what a hash code actually was uh, until a few weeks ago. And the person who got me off the ground with hash codes here was David Freestone, who knows vastly more about the actual use of hash codes uh, uh, than I do. So I'm nervous about uh, whether I'm going to stay on safe uh, ground here. Um, the, uh, so here's my understanding of what, and also Matthew, of course, can uh, weigh in on whether I've got it right on, uh, on hash codes. Um, my understanding is, suppose you have a whole text, right? you know, a whole Word document, right? So it's uh, hundreds of thousands of bits. Um, and you need an internal name for this. Of course, the user would assign some cockamamie 
the computer is going to store this, and it wants an internally usable name for this. And, and it certainly doesn't want to store a name that's 100,000 bits long. I mean, that, that madness. Uh, it would like to store a, a nice short name, 32 bits, 64 bits, but a name that it, with very high probability, not necessarily total certainty, but with very high probability is unique to the thing that it names, right? So it can be used as a tag or a pointer in Zen and sense. You apply a hash function. So this 100,000 bits, it's a number. If you think it's a, it was my love letter to my long lost, but the computer thinks, oh, this is just a lot of bits. Bits are numbers, right? Uh, I have all kinds of fancy, clever functions that I can apply to any number, like encryption functions, but I can apply a hash function. A hash function, by definition, check me if I got this wrong, will uh, take this huge number and spit out a 32-bit or a 64-bit, a number that's both short and of fixed length, both very convenient, which has been generated from that content, but which is not the content. You can't retrieve the content from this. It's obviously just collected, uh, collapsed 100,000 uh, bits into 32 bits, so clearly you cannot recover the original from it, but is mathematically connected to the uh, thing that it names. And here, now I get into what I think may be very deep work. I, so there are many different hash functions. They're purpose-specific, domain-specific. I think I've got that right, yeah. I think, here I'm question. I think they can be crafted so that um, something that bears a strong resemblance to the thing that is encoded, but it's not that same thing, will be near it in the hash table. Have I got that right? I know it's not the usual. In fact, I hasten to add that they can be crafted for the exact opposite. That is, uh, they can be so crafted that if I, I alter so much as a single bit in those 100,000 bits, I get a hash code that's a totally different um, uh, number. But the, the, the only point that's essential to this, uh, to what I'm arguing, is that, look, this solves the naming problem, in, in, which is inherent in any computational system. The, you're constantly creating these new entities, these new concepts. They need labels. They need uh, names. The names are going to be, in one sense, opaque. They will, uh, the hash code does not give you anything like uh, everything that you, to, to make inferences from the thing that you've named with the hash code, you have to get back to what it was computed from. Is everybody clear about that? Um, but they provide a name and they provide a way of accessing uh, the information that you need in order to draw uh, inferences. And so again, and I, I skipped over the addressing, but uh, modern computers make uh, wholesale use of the order property and even the interval property of the numbers in uh, express, the way in which they represent relations between things is basically by where things are uh, in memory. And there's all kinds of pointer arithmetic and so on, which is computations being done uh, with addresses that are the key to getting from one item in memory to another item in memory, and they're the key to relational uh, databases, and the relational databases are the key to the kinds of inferences, at least in traditional AI, that um, the computing machine uh, can make. Uh, so I think yeah, so here's the conclusions. The brains are number processing machines. Many properties of number are analytic in the sense that they are true about the processing of the symbols, their mathematical truths, regardless of their reference. Arithmetic processing is unreasonably effective in representing the natural world, and that's exactly why it's an unreasonably effective in cognitive science, because I'm a flaming representationalist uh, and computationalist, to my mind, the cognitive uh, science is the science of how brains represent uh, the world in which they uh, operate. And so my interest in numbers derives from the fact that they seem to be uniquely uh, 
uh, powerful and effective in, uh, and, and simple and elegant in um, their ability to represent the natural world that we're trying, that the brain is trying to cope with. Um, the uh, brain is a computing machine. You can see, I think I take that claim more seriously than anybody else alive. Uh, in that I think practically everything that uh, has been learned by computer scientists is applicable in one way or another to uh, understanding uh, how brains uh, work. Um, but brain is a computing machine and all computing machines since they were first imagined, say by Babbage and Ada, uh, must be based on the manipulation of symbols for quantities. That's what they were at the beginning and that's what they still are. The people in Intel are mostly optimizing those machines for uh, working with uh, numbers because so much of what goes on under the hood is uh, numerical in nature, even when dealing with all the many things that don't seem to be intrinsically numerical. Uh, so all the brain symbols are numbers uh, or constructed from numbers, strings of numbers like vectors and, um, uh, or arrangements of numbers like matrices. Therefore, it's numbers all the way down. I thank you for listening to this. And again, I thank Brian and Ernie. So, George, you want to have a go with that? <laughs> yes, uh, Louise. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, I'll say some stuff, and then if it's wrong, just tell me, and that'll be the end. But um, it sounds like you were saying that the way we represent color in the brain mm -hmm. um, makes it physically impossible for us to perceive something as being red and green at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, a red-green color. Yes. Yeah. 
first that um, um, they had two properties, as they mentioned. Um, uh, if you ask them to construct a similarity space mm -hmm. in the ordinary way, mm -hmm. to take the one that's closest. You know, color, the color similarity space, yes. Yeah. Color similarity space. Yes. Yeah. So in their deranged fashion. Yes, right. And such that when you, you turn it over and we get one, two, three, four, five, they get one, four, two. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. systematic, but a different yeah, yeah. computation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The adjacency relations were yeah. all screwed up, but yeah. Yeah, not all screwed up. No, part of Different. Yeah, yeah, different. Yeah. But at the same time. I'll repeat. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, I'll repeat. But at the same time. Yeah. They had noticed, which was the genesis of their study, because yeah. they weren't initially interested in Benjamin work and all that. Yeah. But they had noticed uh, that some of these people, not all yeah. some of the people that, that, who show this yeah. uh, color blindness, yeah. this particular color blindness, yeah. name colors more or less consensual, yeah. like a few hours along the way. Yeah. of 
color terms. And I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do justice to this, but it, roughly the story would look like this. Um, the, one of the things she showed quite persuasively, at least in my mind, is that however many color terms you use, and of course cultures differ greatly, right? she had 110 cultures, some of them only use more, only have three color words that they use. Uh, three of those words account for like 99.5% of all the color usages in that linguistic community. Whereas, of course, we have quite a, a number more, although I've never myself been clear about exactly what teal referred to, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, and I assume most decorators know exactly what teal refers to. But uh, the, uh, it, the, thesis, the underlying thesis was that however many you're using, you're using, you're efficiently encoding the space. And this, and this is a powerful idea. This yields quantitative results about where the contours of the uh, encoding should be. And it also yields quantitative results if a new color term comes into your uh, language. Uh, what will happen to these boundaries? Because now a new mountain will grow, right? Uh, for that, and that's going to squeeze the others and so on. And so this gives an a quantitative account. Now, how does this address your question? Well, the problem with Duner notes isn't in the vector space. The problem with the Duner notes is out there in the cones. Right? They lack the third cone. But there's every reason to believe they've got the vector space, right? They're just not mapping into it. And our language refers to the, to the vector space, the locations in the vector space, right? Not to the, the cones. So on this story, using efficient coding, which I would argue has a great deal to, and she would argue, a great deal to do with semantics in general. Uh, these people had figured out that there was this kind of terra incognita and that the name of in this terra incognito was X. So they were now how they were able to get from their cone captures to this, and that's I'm not actually specifying that, but the idea is that they had figured out just linguistically this maps, of course, to your blind <laughs> children learning the meaning of look. Yeah. Uh, they had figured out the name in the culture they lived in for the part of the space that they uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't really uh, reliably perceive. That's right. That's, that's, the, that's the story, roughly. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we're going to, I think that's in the back. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm trying to figure out what exactly, because that's a funny just happened, and I'm not sure how exactly I should deal with why we're in one's shoes. That's true. So, for instance, you look at transparency, so I can have, you know, I can be competent speaker of the language and yet be completely wacky about drawing colors. You're, you're absolutely right that this isn't going to do most of the work. That, uh, for instance, I, at least as I was looking at this moment, this is no help at all in deciding whether uh, cats or animals are, or mammals or vertebrates or whatever, whether that's analytic. Frankly, it seems to me. Clearly, it's empirical, but it's synthetic, but I, this isn't going to be much help with the traditional uh, examples, except in pushing you strongly toward the idea that, keep in mind, the analytic distinction was largely to rescue mathematics. And this does rescue. The, when Jerry and I were sailing, Jerry was such a determined arguer, right? And so even when you pinned him down with a killer example, that he was telling me there are no definitional concepts. I said, Jerry, prime number is a definitional concept. And this pause, and you knew you'd score when you paused. So he thought, <laughs> he, paused. <laughs> he paused for a while, and he ground his teeth, and then he watched that argument why prime number wasn't definitional, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
think like, you know, what is yellow and blue, right? So it seems like even there I will be completely, like if there is a sense in which the analytic inference that you resuscitate is not that scary at all. Right? No. In fact, when I was asking, they, they didn't seem to think that there was simple fact of the matter about what was red, about redness out there in the world. And if there's anything we've learned from color science is, it's not exactly that you can't construct a story about what there is out there in the world that corresponds to redness, but it is nowhere near your intuitive theory and cannot be constructed without a heavy dose of information theory and physiology and, and a lot of other stuff, like a, a half of a graduate seminar, right? So, um, is that more or less right, Brian? Right? Uh, I'm sorry? It's not linguistic confidence, it's not reflective. Exactly, exactly. Uh, in fact, Jerry and I, I would say, I don't think this, of course, he was killers with these arguments about definitions. He mastered them, of course, he was so funny about them and so on. And so he'd run them by and say, look, you know, I, I stipulate that when it comes to language, uh, definitions are hopeless. But, and I, he knew, sort of knew this was a traditional move and he was at us, a traditional move. I'd say, but in the underlying conceptual system, there are these definitions. And they discussed that move in Fodor. Uh, and I said there, were, there are primitives and so on, and he, they, he quips, well, many people have argued this, but no one's ever been willing to say what the primitives were. <laughs> Jerry, I'm here to say what the primitives are, and I only wish you were here to show me why this is crazy. Uh, uh, on that note, yeah. uh, I think I declare the end session has ended, but there is, of course, lots of future and promise. Uh, but let's uh, take this moment. Thank you.